Um, anybody want to start with a little reporting back? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Go, Melinda Lopez. Uh, oh, uh, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna uh, talk at length. I just think what what really our conversation started very safe and demure and talking about our feelings and um, you know we really did we we moved at at length into um, a much more of a social justice access conversation um, and uh, whether that's the playwright's job or the theater's job um, and how do we um, open the doors and so um, we we did sort of leave the leave the world of the residency, although we we do we are bringing it back to how our um, activism, or not, can be supported by the Mellon Foundation, or how our voices can amplify that conversation. So I think pro all of us feel very motivated to go back to our host theaters and say, we need to look at this question of access ticket prices, availability, et cetera. How do we open the doors? Great. Um, we're, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna hear some more things, but then let's come back to what that, would, what that means. So um, other uh, people, here, I'll hand you more. Uh, well, I'd like to say, since I was comparing this gathering of artistic directors to the, the first cohort, I was really pleased to see how quickly the conversation went to how can we support the work of this cohort of playwrights being produced, workshops supported by all the other theaters in the group, which was, which was really great. Uh, that is not at all where the conversation went the first um, year. And so there are all kinds of ideas about how we would all like to know whatever seeds of play ideas you guys are all working on now to share that among us because chances are even with just like a little two or three sentence synopsis of what you're thinking about, there may be a couple of other theaters that would jump on board and go, yeah, and we'd like to have you come out here and do a workshop of it here. And so just ways to move the work around um, and Jack, for example, is on the National New Play Network and making a stronger connection between this cohort and that organization as a way to just get your work moved around, um, which was, so that was a big right. conversation. You, you know, one of the things I want us just to think about very concretely, and we don't have to figure it out today, but I've heard that suggestion uh, more than once over the last two days, and I, I think, um, uh, one of the questions is, what is the infrastructure already in existence? Is it the National New Play Network that would be um, a partner with a cohort like this? Uh, in what way, I know we've, there's been a lot of conversation about um, uh, HowlRound being able to share information, which I think we can do, but just trying to think about, uh, you know, in concrete terms, not, uh, uh, not to let these ideas fall by the wayside, but to go, what role can HowlRound play? What role can existing uh, theaters in this cohort play, and then what are the other organizations at play who would be helpful here? So, and um, us beginning to sort out which uh, which thing is where. And one of the ideas I just want to throw out there, because I know having been through these conversations before, is um, uh, as we get to the wrap up, like you know, what w w let's make sure we think about next steps for these good ideas. So. Um, we did talk about it being a two-headed thing where it would probably be useful for us to have to give you the information to get out to the other theaters about what each playwright was working on internally, but also to have the conversations between the artistic director and the playwrights about what other institutions within the cohort do the playwrights want to reach out to that we can also help, you know, if Lauren wants to be working with the Alliance or Lauren wants to be working with OSF or wherever, that I can also reach out and say, if you have an opportunity, my resident playwright would like to come spend some time with you if you can make that happen. So it might be a two-way sort of street. It's like creating a mini map. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, I'm really loud. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's, like, it's like creating a mini map where uh, this cohort of theaters would be the mini map where we could, sh we would know when other people's works are premiering 
and we could go see it or, or what's being developed by that writer at a particular theater that maybe we could help vis-a-vis -vis like readings, workshops, even just like drop-ins. Um, uh, so that's, yeah. And would there be, uh, one of the ideas that sparks in my head immediately about this is that you all talking to each other, and, and, and I'm now I'm speaking to the artistic uh, leaders of the organizations, but this would be true for playwrights as well, but you all talking to each other about the work, for example, that you're developing with your playwright feels so critical, and would it be valuable for you to all commit to a meeting every six months to update each other uh, through the course of this, you know, just to be on phone, just to be on the phone together to each talk about projects that your playwright's working on and things you're excited about and but anyway just uh, that was an idea that just suddenly sparked into my head like that you're actually talking to each other because it's it's sometimes like there uh, Hal Ron can send out a list oh you know uh, this cohort's developing this play and this uh, this person's developing this play but there's nothing more exciting than an artistic director saying oh my god you know so, so and so is working on this play and you've got to read it and I can't wait to send it to you so anyway just a thought um, uh, yeah Interesting for for the playwrights. I mean, I know we're all busy, but to have maybe every six months there's some kind of coordinated phone meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have our contacts, but sometimes Luis might say something that sparks something to me, and then Mark, you know. So maybe there could be some kind of every six or eight months we can get yeah. together for an hour, you know, on on the phone like that. You know, coordinated through how around. I, I would benefit. I know I would benefit from that a lot. Yeah, and that's an, uh, I won't say easy because it's scheduling, but it, it's easy to send out a doodle form and get, you know, um, maybe 10 out of 18 on the phone or right. 12 out of, you know what I mean? Right. Something right. like yeah. that, yeah. 19 on the phone. And so um, I think that's something we could easily do yeah. for both cohorts if you decide that that's something you, both, you know, groups, if that's something we decide on. So I, I love that idea. Uh, other, um, other things that came out of your discussion. Any nuts and bolts kinds of questions that um, would be useful for the whole group to hear the answer to? Uh, they were not my ideas, but uh, two things came up that really seemed to bear us resonate. Somebody brought up the notion of what happens when you change, and I think that was really great. Uh, how to negotiate change, and how to negotiate the communication of change. So let's say your play starts to change, or the way you want to make the play, or if you're a first-time cohort, uh, and there are things you don't want to do inside of those requirements, how do you just negotiate that? So that popped up, and the other what I thought was really interesting is the difference between small staff theaters and larger theaters, and how they both operate in two very different ways. And so I could sense that in our, our group, there are two different ways of working. And is there something to be learned one to the other? Um, or is it, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, is that something that you would discuss in six months? Or was there something that, I just wonder if there was like a takeaway that. Well, those are things I heard, but I would love if anybody wants yeah. to address who brought it up. That would be great, because yeah. it would be great to just, I don't want to talk for anybody, basically. Yeah. And I was kind of asleep. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. No, I just was curious. Uh, yes. Well, you know, I don't know if there's a takeaway, but it was an observation I made that I think that the size of the theater really affects the experience you have with the theater, whether or not there's an office you're supposed to go to or the flexibility, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, I don't know. I, it was just, uh, you know, I think an observation. And I think it, was, it seems to be really useful for people um, of similar size theaters to be able to talk, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did artistic directors find that as well? Is it similar sized theaters is more more help? Yeah, anybody want to comment on that or just nod heads is fine too. Uh, did, sorry. Oh yeah, Herbert, go ahead. And then one more. There was a, yeah, there was a big difference between the big theaters and the smaller theaters, but I think overall we all had the same concern that the the demographics, the our audience, the audience is pretty much the same whether it's bigger or smaller. And uh, you know we all get excited when there's a preview and there's a lot of comps and there's a lot of big diverse audience in the previews and then the run starts and you see you know you start seeing the the homogene homogeneity of the of the audience and we're, we're concerned about that. Great. Uh, who else is? Talk. Yeah, I know. <laughs> who, who else? Who else wants? Who's dying for a microphone? It's so much fun. Other things you learned from each other? Yeah, Nathan. No, I, I don't know if this is what, it, I'm probably reiterating, but just the 
importance of communication and communication between the writer and the organization, but as well as the writer and the organization with how around it's just it, it, it's very important. And and not, and and when things I think we talk about change when things change, it's okay to say, hey, this is not I thought it was going to be this way. It's not, and and can we adjust that and be open to that? Um, I think you had mentioned it, Jerry. One thing was the, the office, because I had an office up with everybody else, and at one point I was like, I can't write in this office. There's too many people in this office. The other building has cubicles and walls up, and I can write in that building. And I think there was a level of, well, we won't see you as much. And I was like, well, yeah, you won't see me as much, but I'll get some writing done. And that was cool. We had that. We were able to have that conversation. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great uh, a great point, and I wonder if I can ask this question and you know answer or not. But one of the questions I wondered if you addressed it all in either of the groups. Um, I mean, just what is the ex what are your expectations? Are you going to the uh, are the playwrights coming to the office um, two days a week or three days a week or one day a week or um, are they do they have an office? Do they? I mean, I just wonder, did you guys talk about expectations like that? And is there something that would be useful for the whole group? Yeah useful or not because we're newbies, but I realize that as, as well as I feel like I know Christina, I don't know her writing process. Well, I kind of do. I used to get rewrites at four in the morning, but <laughs> other than that, I really <laughs> didn't know her writing process. So one of the first things I asked was, can you write in the office? I don't know. I, so I'm, I'm trying to be open and just adjust to uh, this new relation, this relationship that's been existent but in a new form and you know really ask the question like do you write in an office can you write here and I don't know if she knows that or not but you know these are some of the things that I feel like we're gonna try and, and I, I I got the sense from my cohorts that um, that that's okay to try those things rather than try to um, fit her into some kind of box um, I do actually know for a fact, unless you're a Denny's, it's unlikely that Christine, is that still true? Do you write at the Denny's still? No, oh my God, all right, that's so shocking. All right, uh, anyway, don't you remember? Yeah. 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 I used to get uh, Christina Ham emails at four in the morning from the Denny's, so I just want, I just, that's all I'm saying. Um, yeah. the, uh, that's really helpful. Anybody else from the artistic director side have comment about that? Oh yeah, sorry, Michelle, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm just again comparing to the, the first cohort and it feels like everybody going into this has a much more realistic sense of expectations than that first time where, I mean, again, as I'd said to our artistic directors at 10,000 Things, we don't have offices, so there's absolutely no expectation that you would come, I mean, I imagine you write in bed, I don't know what you do, but like that's just like not an interesting question to me in any sense, and yet different cultures have different things. But, and so the first time, I mean, I just heard all kinds of artistic directors going, they need to be in here five days a week, nine to five. And nobody was saying that this time. So there was a lot more realistic and flexible expectations around office time than I heard the first time, which was really great. I think it's it, we've all learned from this first year, and the second second uh, round cohort people were asking really thoughtful, intelligent questions. So it seems like everybody's going into this with a much more realistic sense of expectations around that. If that's yeah. helpful. No, it's really helpful. I think that's great. Um, other feedback. Susan Booth, do you have anything from where you are? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the thing that became really clear. Way uh, interchangeable. Um, we have the luxury that Pearl's a longtime Atlanta resident, but the office time that became really invaluable was as uh, a conscience colleague, right? As as a citizen colleague, and knowing that Pearl would be a regular presence. Uh, in, in the building and whether it was me in her office or her in mine or any of our staff in her office, it was about conversation, not about producing uh, written text. And that became a, that's been a very important thing. And um, it, it's sort of like where the therapist's office is. And sometimes she's in it and sometimes she's not. Super helpful. Thanks uh, for that, Susan. Nathan. 
real quick because uh, she said uh, Susan said conversation, and I was happened to be in Atlanta and I was invited in on a like a like a little conversation that they I think she had said to me you know, that schedules are busy and sometimes all we have is Friday to get together and have my God what a great conversation I was a part of. And I, I'm just thinking to myself, it's not a matter of how much you see each other or work. Just find that time to sit. And they didn't even talk about work. They were just talking. It was just a matter of talking. And I thought it was just so great. I thought it was just so great. So I, Susan's right. I witnessed it. it was, I wanted to move to Atlanta. It was such a good conversation. I have heard, though, so many times the importance of um, uh, the playwright just being around um, and what it means for the playwright just to be around um, and present in whatever what, the, what that means in each context is different. So, Sam, yeah. Yeah, I want to speak to that. Um, there's a word that is really important to me, and it's being a citizen of my community, that I'm not just somebody who makes plays and sells tickets, but I actually live there. I care about the health of the community. I care about the diversity. I care about justice. I care about the future of the community. I've lived in my city for most of my life. I've done 40 years of theater there. I've seen it transform and change and become a progressive city that it wasn't before. So it's actually manifest a lot of the things I've tried to achieve. And all of this is a preamble of saying one of the great values of having someone like Herbert as a playwright in residence is you, is you use the word conscience, I think she used. But it's that someone who also thinks about citizenship. You know, a lot of the people around me are thinking about production, they're thinking about selling tickets, they're thinking about are the restrooms clean, they're thinking about what's the marquee say to not tomorrow, and how about that guy who fell down the stairs that was 95 years old, and all the things that go on every day, but who's thinking about the role of the theater in the community, who's thinking about what we look, what we sound like and look like, and who we are and who we open our doors to, who we represent, who we bring in, I expect Herbert to do that, and he does do that. And he is also thinking as a, as a citizen, and I have to say, not a lot of people on my staff do that. I speak about it and they go, what's that? I said, well, okay, if you don't know, then we'll talk to someone else, but. I think you brought it up that we're there, we're there to carry out your mission, you know what I'm saying? We represent your mission, and the other people are, you know, staff represents the day to day, but we represent your general mission. Uh, and another thing is the, uh, that came up to me today that was funny is that all organizations are dysfunctional, like for sure. <laughs> They're all dysfunctional from top to bottom, and we're not there to, to fix it, you know? You know, there's that, oh, I wish I could, no, I shouldn't do it, you know? That's not our role, you know? That's not our role, because that could take a lot of energy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, I'm remembering back to the last cohort meeting, and... Um, uh, comments by both Bill and Susan, and Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, but they both said they couldn't imagine um, programming, a, programming a season anymore without Luis and Pearl at their sides. And we haven't talked a lot about programming here. Uh, Kevin, at a sidebar, we were started talking about the influence of this program on the aesthetics of American theater, and just wondering what people are thinking about that, that particular issue. <laughs> yeah, please. I mean, there will not be a play that we produce that Herbert hasn't read and commented on. I mean, bottom line. He's part of our selection team automatically, artistic selection team. In fact, part of what we're doing is trying to share plays with him that he may not have read. He just read a Taylor Mac play the other day, didn't know that worked. So part of our job, I think, is to, if you will, raise the consciousness of our playwright understanding of the field. So it's completely integrated and central. Uh, other responses to that or com other comments? Yeah. So um, our artist selection process for our resident artists is always a panel process of six to eight people and it always involves at least one resident artist that's current and a former resident artist. So it kind of carries the like philosophy of what the art making of the theater forward. And so Taylor has served on that panel before and then for the three years he'll serve on that panel. And then a second part of it is that Kim and I usually interview the finalists that the panel has selected like 10 people out of the 150 applicants. And then we do interviews with them and pick the two or three that are gonna be in the cohort going forward. So Taylor is gonna be part of that process with Kim and I in terms of making the final determination of the artists. So that'll be a new thing that we're trying that's different than what we've done before. That's great. Um, 
Other, as we wrap up before a break, any other comments about that? Peter, yeah. Just, just, one, just one quick thing, because we work the same way that Melinda's on the artistic staff and she reads everything we read. Um, she's also someone whose work we're programming. So in those artistic staff meetings, we're also talking about uh, whatever dramaturgical challenges with the plays or, you know, that's something we talk about as a, as a group. And um, so the, the challenge becomes how do we not feel like a reality show where we have to send Melinda out of the room and then she has to guess what everyone thinks of their play based on if they're looking down at their coffee or <laughs> making eye contact. So I think everyone has to negotiate that in their own way in terms of just how do you begin to talk about the artist's work uh, when the artist is an integral part of the team that chooses and critiques the, the work that you produce. Um, I was just going to say, since I just started July 1st, um, part of my responsibility is also being part of our artistic team at Pillsbury House and um, helping Faye and Noel with recommending plays because of my dual role also at the Playwright Center of interacting with a lot of new plays that I think can be helpful in terms of possible programming and also looking to um, take on the role of curating the new play series there um, with playwrights from Minneapolis and New York. And what does that mean to now go from still being a theater administrator in a different way, but also kind of taking more of a lead role in that, so. Um, great, so we're gonna take a break uh, for 15 minutes, come back